So I'm going to go through the features of the life cycle as they pertain to mostly the early land plants and uh, the early land plants would be the most similar, uh, the ones that we don't have, let's see, the ones that would have been around millions of years ago, uh, those ones would be most similar to what we have today as the non-vascular land plants. So we'll spend lots of time on those. I also mention other groups as they come up. So uh, I mentioned this valuable evolutionary adaptation of spores. So this is a life cycle phase where basically the whole genetic uh, essence of an organism can be contained inside of this cell with a hard exterior coating. So that's protective against drying and also good at blowing around for dispersal. So here's some examples of uh, spores that are present in a liver wart. So the leafy background of this image on the right here, uh, this is the gametophyte. So when we look at a liver wart or a moss or a horn wart, the green leafy stuff that we see is gametophytes. So that makes it a multicellular haploid. And parts of that are designated to produce uh, gametes. And the gametes that are the eggs become the site of fertilization. And that's where the zygote forms and turns into the embryo. So uh, already we're looking at a few life cycle phases. And you're probably looking at me a little bit confused because I've thrown all those words back at you. So uh, multicellular gametophyte had an egg. Egg was fertilized by a sperm. And that zygote that resulted from fertilization grew up into the embryo. So in these uh, groups of land plants, the non-vascular land plants, the embryo and then the cells, uh, the, the organism that develops from that, the sporophyte, is short-lived and typically pretty small. And its job is to generate a whole bunch of cells that can become those spores for dispersal. So this is the, the base of the sporophyte. And inside of here, most of its space is devoted to this spore capsule. So it's made spores and it's ready to disperse them uh, and these colorful egg looking things here, uh, all pretty small still. All right, so there are the spores being made. Uh, this is what spores look like under high power magnification. So electron microscope can tell you the, the textures of the surface of these spores, sometimes very distinctive. Uh, one feature of the texture on the surface that you often find is this mark called a trilete mark. And this is something they see in fossils really as evidence that what they found in the fossils is this fossilized spore. What is it? Well, what that is, is one spore that shows the scars of where it was attached to one, two, three other spores. So they were formed as what we call a tetrad or a foursome. And they, uh, by pressing each spore against three other spores, you get this three-parted mark. Uh, tells you where those other spores are located. But they do uh, separate out and disperse on their own. Uh, nicely shown here also in the lycophyte spores, that trilete mark on one of the faces of the spore. Uh, tells you that it was made as a foursome, four cells as we've seen in other classes resulting from meiosis and now separated out ready for dispersal. Uh, here's an interesting example. Sometimes I don't know where to put these contexts. So uh, we're going to kind of talk about life cycles and then also focus on some of these non-vascular land plants. This is an interesting group of non-vascular land plants. has an interesting name and a super interesting dispersal mechanism. So this is called splachnum. And they go by the name of dung mosses. So this is a moss that is specialized to grow in poop. And sure enough, that's where it's growing right here. And uh, as it grows in poop, it, it's surrounded by the heady aroma of fecal matter, and that attracts flies. So not only is the, the poop itself kind of smelly, but this moss actually makes a smell uh, that mimics that smell and is more attractive to the flies. So it's kind of a double whammy, get these flies interested. Flies come to poop. You've probably experienced that in your life. Let's hope not too much. And as the flies come, they come and explore the parts that are really smelly. And this uh, moss has a strategy of getting the fly to explore the parts of its uh, sporophyte 
So these stalked things are sporophytes capped by a spore capsule. And the fly explores that area and gets the spores on it. So this is a, it's very similar to what we see in pollination in the flowering plants, but this is a uh, more of a one-way dispersal from the uh, mature parts of a dung moss on uh, poop that's probably pretty well decomposed. And where do the flies go next? More poop. So if this fly then goes to a fresh pile of dung that doesn't have any moss on it, then it's going to drop those spores and start the new generation uh, of the moss growing up. So moss down here at the base, this is the haploid gametophyte. Uh, can't really see what happened there, but there was fertilization events, and then the fertiliz fertilization events gave rise to each of these stalked store, uh, sporophytes, then uh, with dispersing spores at the top. All right, so what happens when that moss, uh, dung moss spore lands on some poop? Well, this isn't poop, but it's the same thing that happens in other mosses. So the spore lands and the spore germinates. And what first comes out of the spore uh, is this filamentous green. So this is uh, multicellular, this is gametophyte, but it doesn't look like anything yet. So the first cells to come out of the spore, they have to sort of organize, they have to gather up nutrients, and uh, they end up making this kind of netty form uh, over the soil, or here we have them growing artificially in a petri dish. They gather up their nutrients until they have enough mass where they can commit to making the more familiar moss form. So uh, out here in this field, this is the filamentous uh, haploid cells. And then uh, those are all connected together. And then in this area, they have decided to make the leaves. So we see leafy green tissue here. And this is going to grow upwards and make more familiar moss plant grows. So spore germinates into haploid tissue and part of that haploid tissue uh, becomes the haploid gametophyte for the moss. So this is another example of a gametophyte. This is a liverwort gametophyte. Uh, taking its name from somebody said that decided they decided this looked like liver. I don't know, flat and slimy and shiny, who knows. Liverwort, uh, also a non-vascular land plant. So those gametophytes grow up. Gametophytes, as we've seen, produce gametes. So if you don't remember whether they're diploid or haploid, you should at least be able to remember that gamete, uh, gametophytes make gametes, sporophytes make spores as the next stage in the life cycle. Uh, these are some examples I showed you earlier, an image of this kind of corkscrew moss sperm. And here's some other images of moss. This is a diagram of a couple different kinds of non-vascular land plant uh, sperm cells. So very different from what you're familiar with in animals. Uh, these are, we still call them sperm cells, but they are really a whole independent origin from the animal sperm cell. So they take on a different appearance. They still have flagella they can get themselves around with, but they do this more kind of corkscrew transmission. So it looks in here like a bunch of flies buzzing around. Those are those sperm cells do, 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 uh, heading around until they can get close to where an egg cell is uh, in this fern gametophyte zone. Pretty cool. Uh, another example of animals involved in transmission in mosses the previous example with the dung mosses was uh, involved flies carrying spores. These are insects that carry uh, sperm. <laughs> so uh, this is an insect called a springtail, as you might have learned about in your uh, invertebrate diversity classes. Very small. Here's a moss for scale. Uh, springtails found a lot of places in the environment, and it turns out that springtails can be responsible for transporting sperm from one moss to another. So you saw the swimming sperm cells. Uh, what if you're maybe a taller moss plant and it's harder for sperm to swim a long distance? Hitchhike on a springtail. Hey, springtail, you got some sperm on you. So, uh, they suspected this was the case of uh, springtails transporting sperm cells. And uh, another good example here of a, an experiment. We'll talk about experiments and setting up experiments. This is an experiment set to determine whether those springtails were really responsible 
and let's say required for getting the sperm cells between moss plants. So they took moss plants and they separated them by some distance. Uh, they can separate male and female parts of these moss plants. And when they weren't separated, fertilization was not a problem. Sperm could get from one plant to another. But when those moss plants were separated, in the absence of animals, there was no fertilization between moss plants that were even two centimeters apart. So the sperm cells were not able to swim down one plant and up the other. But in the presence of animals, uh, in this case, either springtails or mites, those sperm cells were able to hitchhike on the animals and make it from one plant to another. Crazy. Uh, here's some videos and a link to a longer video of these. This is uh, the experiment where they had moss colonies separate from each other and those little organisms skittering from one side to the next. These are springtails exploring their environment. So taking advantage, the moss takes advantage of their behavior, which has them exploring new places to get their food or whatever they're doing. And as they move around, they bring some sperm with them. Uh, another example for getting your sperm around, this is from another non-vascular land plant, a liverwort. Uh, maybe you should check out the full video of this one. In the full video, it shows that right before the video starts, uh, they spray this with some water. So in response to being wet, this liverwort kicks into sperm dispersal gear. <laughs> These are clouds of sperm cells uh, being dispersed into the air after a uh, sign of being wet. So the rain starts. Uh, we'll talk about later maybe what the conditions are good for getting sperm cells around. If your sperm cells have to swim in water, it's good to have them move around when things are wet. So this plant determines that it's wet, says good time to release my sperm, boom, sperm out in the world, shot into the air, and then they land somewhere and ideally uh, swim their way to an egg on some other nearby liverwort. Uh, this is a model liverwort. This is uh, one of our model organisms. If you were to study non-vascular land plants, you might get familiar with this one, or there's another moss called Fiscometrella. Uh, these are non-vascular plants that have gotten a decent amount of study, in part because they are known to have sex chromosomes. So uh, they call them X and Y, just like our X and Y, and there are genes on those chromosomes that determine the sex of the uh, gametophyte. So you can have a male gametophyte that makes sperm cells and a female gametophyte that makes egg cells. And what's shown in this image is uh, just a, a whole bunch of individuals growing close together. Uh, they have these stalks that they produce sperm cells on or egg cells. The sperm cells are open in this uh, kind of platter arrangement and the egg cells are produced on the underside of these kind of umbrella looking structures. And uh, if you get to a lab where you're doing experiments with uh, this plant called Marcantia, then you can take the sperm cells off of a male sperm holding stalk. Uh, so they're shown putting some, some water on top of that. Uh, they put the water on, they give it some time for the sperm cells to percolate into the water. Then they take it off and then in the right hand image, uh, they're putting the sperm cells into the proximity of the egg cells there. And you can see it's really clever there. I don't know, the, uh, the umbrella kind of feature on that female uh, egg device, egg holding device, uh, kind of wicks up the, the water. So it creates a nice environment for sperm cells to swim in and then find those eggs. So you can do this artificially, artificially transfer sperm cells from one known parent to one known parent. Uh, so effective and so interesting that somebody was inspired to make a uh, plastic analog of that. So we saw in the last video how that umbrella kind of structure was really good at wicking up that droplet of water. And uh, somebody said, maybe we could use that as a bio, biologically inspired pipette. Who knows? I guess if you needed to transfer a small glob of liquid from one place to another, this might be the thing for you. Uh, it just takes advantage of surface tension properties to uh, hold on to that water droplet. Okay, so after the sperm makes it to the egg, then we're back around to making the sporophyte, 
And the sporophyte, as I mentioned before, uh, typically small and short-lived. So this one is so small, it's basically microscopic. You can see the individual cells. So this is sort of the stalk of the sporophyte, but most of the sporophyte is this chamber with spores inside. Uh, in a moss, a lot of times you've got a longer stalk. This serves to elevate the spores up above the ground uh, and give them a better chance as they disperse in the air of getting farther away from the plant. Uh, this is another one. This is a peat moss on the right. So uh, sporophyte, this is still part of the sporophyte, this green bit, and then the darkly colored part as uh, the spore chamber itself. And because the sporophyte is nourished by the gametophyte, uh, because it grows out of the place where the egg used to be, then you see these two life cycle phases connected to each other. So if you happen to catch them in their reproductive phase, you can see the, uh, the haploid gametophyte as the green leafy stuff on these non-vascular land plants and then something coming out of them, stalk usually, uh, which is the sporophyte with the spore capsules on there, uh, all connected together as we've seen here and also in other, <clears throat> other images that I showed you. So just another illustration uh, shows the sporophytes kind of lengthening. And then as they mature and dry out, the spore capsule bursts open and becomes kind of dusty with spores on top of there. So as things dry out, that's a good condition for dispersing your spores. Uh, also as they get higher above the, the gametophyte, they're in a better position to disperse. All right, so that was a lot about the non-vascular land plants. And maybe we'll take a little break here.